Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Public Policy Luncheon. My name is Lisa Grant Ludwig and I'm the chair of SSA's Government Relations Committee. Today we have a very interesting talk on an important topic, seismic retrofit of unreinforced masonry buildings. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our multi-talented and engaging speaker. Now imagine the person it would take to skillfully oversee the emergency management for a region that ranks number one in the nation for the number of hazards it faces. We're talking storms, landslides, floods, earthquakes, social unrest, terrorism, not to mention close proximity to one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the world. You would need someone who can build a strong and closely connected network of support with the mayor, city council, and countless departmental agencies and regional partners. You would need someone who places a strong emphasis on public education so that members of the local community are always in the know. You would need Barb Graff. Since 2005, under her direction, the Seattle Emergency Operations Center has coordinated a citywide response to 16 major exercises and 50 50 incidents eight of which resulted in a presidential declaration. Her program has also received national accreditation. Prior to stepping into her current role, Ms. Graff served in a similar capacity for the city of Bellevue for 21 years. Under her leadership, Bellevue's emergency management program served as the pilot for the national emergency management accreditation process. Today, Ms. Graff chairs both the National Emergency Management Program Review Committee and the Board of Directors of the Big City Emergency Managers Group. And she serves on the Emergency Management Accreditation Commission. She is involved with the King County Advisory Committee on Emergency Management and Regional Homeland Security Council, Washington State Emergency Management Association, and the International Association of Emergency Management. In recent years, her passion for preparation and mitigation also earned her the International Association of Emergency Management's Career Excellence Award. These are just a few of the reasons that we are delighted to welcome her and her insights to the SSA stage. A round of applause, please, for Barb Graff. Thank you so much. Please know how inspired I am to have this many scientists, data-driven scientists, in one room in downtown Seattle. Um, we're not very good at earthquake prediction, as you've, you've already heard throughout the course of your conference, but if you feel something while you're here, our emergency operations center is exactly 1.1 miles south on Fifth Avenue, and I will race you there. Come on down with me and have a good time. Welcome to Seattle. I'm delighted to, ha to have the Seismological Society um, uh, in, in our backyard here, or I guess this will be our front door, um, and it's, it's thrilling to be able to talk with you. Um, I'm going to try and save enough time that if it's possible to entertain some questions at the end of my presentation, I would be thrilled to provide whatever answers I can. But most importantly, if you have ideas about a really difficult problem that we're trying to solve here in Seattle, I am wide open. My grandmother gave me some great advice at one point when I was young, and that was you have two ears and you have one mouth. Use them proportionally. Everything that we've done to try and build this policy, I've been trying to emulate that particular advice. So you should all be able to color in this kind of map uh, rote at this point, but um, as uh, Lisa pointed out to you, we have a very seismologically active area, and one of the, we're doing tons of things about earthquake preparedness, but I'm going to focus on one particular very difficult heavy lift um, that we are envious of the state of California and the progress they've made. The uh, city of Portland, Oregon and Seattle have been in, in a dead heat competition to try and be the first city outside the state of Oregon to require mandatory retrofit of very dangerous old unreinforced masonry buildings. 
By the way, one of the people I'm most inspired with is sitting right in front of me, and so anytime you see Lucy Jones laugh, it means I'm off course or I'm, I'm, I'm proposing something that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But in reality, California has been the envy and the model for us in the Pacific Northwest in many different ways. It was the Southern California fire chiefs who put together the incident command system and made us see the wisdom of using a good management system, resource management, and logistics system, et cetera. And so now we're trying to emulate what was taken care of um, pretty successfully in the state of California 20 or 30 years ago. They've moved on to tilt up concrete and soft story construction. But because of the risks that we live with, we realize you know, not, not everyone is convinced by numbers, but I, I should also thank, um, in, in addition to Lucy in here, some of my favorite scientist friends from the Pacific Northwest, Brian Sherrod and Art Frankel and Paul Bowden. Uh, we lost John Vidali, we replaced him with the wonderful Harold Tobin, and I believe that Bill Steele, our seismologist at the University of Washington, and my friendship goes back until shortly after the Iron Age. So please know everything that we have done in our program to try and prepare our community for the inevitable earthquake has been very influenced by you and the science community. Um, we started by, uh, we're subject to three very different types of earthquakes. I'm not going to go into that because you can teach me more about that. But the number that we're trying to use over and over again now to give a higher sense of urgency is to say that now, today, in April of 2019, we live with the 86% chance of experiencing another Nisqually-type earthquake, deep source earthquake. The last one of those that happened was in February of 2001, prior to that, 1965, prior to that, 1949, and you can hop skip your way back into history about every 20 to 30 years or so. The pictures from those quakes almost always lead off with damage to unreinforced masonry buildings. Um, please know that this effort to address this problem is not the only thing that we do about earthquake preparedness. I'm very proud of the fact that a former mayor, very inspired by the Kobe, Japan earthquake in 1995, came home and helped pass a, a public safety levy that seismically strengthened all of our fire stations, rebuilt a city hall, rebuilt a justice center and police headquarters, um, uh, strengthened water reservoirs, bought for the fire department a brand new fire boat with the equipment to be able to draft water from any type of a water source, not just hydrants and reservoirs, and cached thousands of suppl durable supplies that could be used for mass care services. We have, with the assistance of Federal Emergency Management Assistance Grants, seismically strengthened several of the, the Parks Department community centers that we will use for mass care and sheltering services. Um, we've done a lot of things. We, we participate in every exercise that comes around the corner. We ourselves sponsor quite a number of them. We have trained hundreds of people how to work in our emergency operations center. We require continuity of operations plans for all of our critical um, city departments. So we've done a lot. And yet the thing that, we, the thing that we're still focused on, I've, I have given at least five years of my life and at least that many nights of sleep that we're still trying to address is prim primarily a privately owned vulnerability within our community, and that is unreinforced masonry. So we realize when we talk to people about risk, 86% 80, 80, chance of another Nisqually-sized deep source earth earthquake in the next 50 years. Um, how many people, go ahead and admit it, be truthful, how many people here have ever played blackjack? I'm heartened to know that scientists are as normal as the rest of us. Okay, this is when you get dealt a 19 and the dealer shows an ace and you're asked, do you want to buy insurance? And you know how long it takes you to answer that question when you're sitting at the blackjack table. Ima imagine what it's like for people who own these buildings trying to decide, do I buy insurance? Do I try and address the threat? Imagine what this is like for politicians whose career ordinarily is counted in four-year career increments. This is not an easy thing to, to um, accomplish. The other statistic, therefore, that we added at the top of this slide that you're seeing is, but regardless, there's a 100% chance there is going to be another earthquake, and so you're not going to be able to outlive the problem. It's going to catch up with us. Our last big one was um, 18 years ago, and the way I put it is we are 18 years closer to the next thing that happens about every 20 to 30 years. So unreinforced masonry buildings. 
In 1889, Seattle had an enormous fire. We, we are a lumber um, city originally. Um, and one bad move in, with some hot glue, yes, it was a hot mess, in one cabinet making uh, um, a store in what was then the downtown wound up burning to the ground 20 square blocks of our central business district at the time. There's nothing like a disaster to make people realize they should do something the day after it happens. And therefore, we stopped building back as many structures out of wood and started building back especially the business district and areas around it in brick. Those old brick buildings, unreinforced masonry buildings, have helped us survive and not experience again another massive fire that destroys the entire downtown. But that we're, they're what we have inherited and now represent a lot of history and culture and identity to our community, but they also represent an enormous risk. So for those of you not structural engineers out there, an unreinforced masonry building are those classic red brick structures um, that were primarily built before 1945. In other words, a large variety of change has happened in the, the building codes since then. The parapets, which is the extension of the wall beyond the roof line, are not necessarily secured in any special way um, and, and certainly would not meet the current building code. There's no way in the world we would envision something like this type of construction being allowed again today in our community. But older buildings tend to get grandfathered in, and even though they wouldn't meet today's codes, they nonetheless play, like I said, an important part in the character of our community. Um, this slide is meant to represent what the danger is of those parapets. So again, the extension of the wall beyond the roof line can do damage to one of two groups of people. One, if that, that brick and facade work falls inwardly, that can do tremendous damage to the building and its occupants. But if it falls outwardly, and I'm going to talk more about this, it can do tremendous damage to anyone who happens to find themselves immediately outside of that particular facility. Worse and more catastrophic is the fact that the way this construction comes together is that the floors themselves are not bolted to the walls that hold the building up. Building codes are designed to, to oppose gravity, not necessarily something special like seismic motion that can do many, many different things. The, the walls, or excuse me, the uh, floors actually rest in pockets in the brick not specially bolted, and therefore, in the motion of, of an earthquake, it's not difficult for those entire walls to move in such a way that the floor becomes separated from what was holding it in place to begin with. This is where you see the biggest loss of life. This is where you see the most property damage. This is where you see the most heart-rending conditions post-earthquake, and these are specifically the things that we're trying to address um, with a policy. So let me use a classic example, our own history, Cadillac Hotel. Um, as I mentioned, um, the 1889 fire convinced an awful lot of people we ought to build back in brick. There was a lot of building that happened between the, the 1890s and, and the 1920s. The Cadillac Hotel was one of those on the corner of 2nd and Jackson. Uh, again, just about a, a little over a mile to the south of us. In its heyday, um, it was robust. Um, and in 1920, you could actually rent a hotel room for 25 cents. Not the same idea today, but nonetheless, very vibrant facility. In 1970, there was another hotel in the city of Seattle that had a catastrophic um, fire, loss of life, called the Ozark Fire. And as a result, again, we learn our best lessons and we are motivated to take action after the really bad thing happens. And what city council was motivated to do after the Ozark Hotel Fire was to require all hotels to have adequate fire suppression systems, escape routes, um, uh, fire sprinkler systems, et cetera. What many different uh, hotels, the Cadillac Hotel included, decided to do because this was, not, this was not an easily affordable thing that was being placed on them, this requirement, they decided simply not to occupy the upper two stories of the building. And they're not unique. There are still many buildings in our Chinatown International District that have chosen that same route because of that requirement. But as a result, when we experienced the Nisqually earthquake in February of 2001, we're very glad that those upper two stories were not occupied. And though there was severe damage done to the facility, 
at least it, it were people, it was, it was folks on the main level who were capable of surviving that event. There was enormous pressure simply to demolish that facility and start back over again. And thanks to the good graces of the local historic um, society of Seattle, they were able to put together the millions of dollars necessary to buy the property and over a four year period do the $50 million job it took in order to bring it back to its current glory. So for the, again, those of you who are in town for a little while, um, this is now the Klondike Gold Rush Historic Museum. And it's built to building code. So feel free to wander on down and, and in a safe and confident manner take a look at some of our history. But again, this was only one building. This was one building that took tens of millions of dollars in four years to address. I'm going to expose what more of our problem is. Seattle has a number of, of uh, sister cities around the world, and Christchurch, New Zealand is one of those. They too have similar building codes, similar history, similar seismic risk. And so we took it very much to heart in 2001 about what they had experienced. Again, the things that make the front page news, I'm so out of date, I just came from the social media workshop. The things that make the front of your smartphone news are pictures always, always, always of unreinforced masonry building damage. So we have enough experience of knowing what it is we should expect. Um, I, I am going to say one thing about, about Christchurch, too, that when it comes to cost-benefit analysis, because there's a lot of people who say, this is a very expensive proposition, Barb. Unless you figure out a, a, a way to finance the whole darn thing, we're just not interested in imposing this kind, of, this kind of requirement on the community. But let's put this in perspective. In front of one of these buildings, a, a bus was parked that had nine people on it. And between the bus and the facade of a building, of an unreinforced masonry building, there was four pedestrians. When the, when, when the facade of several of those buildings let loose, like we saw the diagram, let loose onto the sidewalk, it killed the four pedestrians and it killed eight of the nine people on that bus. The sole survivor, Ann Brower, is one of the most articulate mitigation champions you'll ever hear from. What she explains is that the buildings that were immediately to the side of the bus that, that rained all that destruction and brick onto their bus, of the four properties, one property owner had selected voluntarily to do their own retrofit of their building that simply tied the walls and the floors together. And it cost that building owner about $180,000. Now again, for many of these buildings, $180,000 is a lot. But 12 people lost their lives. What was that cost? And, and Anne's medical bills were $504,000. So the cost-benefit analysis is something we've got to keep foremost in our mind. By the way, I'm hoping that I'm the most depressing part of your day. Things should <laughs> cheer back up again this afternoon, I'm, I'm sure. I talked to several of my, my uh, colleagues at, at the table um, as we were having lunch to say this is not the first time Seattle has tried this. So our, our big earthquake in 1965, which did claim lives, which did do significant damage within the Puget Sound area, again, motivated by the fact that it had happened, in 1974, the Seattle City Council did put into place a seismic retrofit ordinance. And four years later, repealed it under enormous pressure from the business, from the business and residential community, saying this is too expensive, you're running us out of town, or they threatened to demolish or abandon their buildings. And caving under that kind of pressure, they took the, the, the ordinance back off the books. We have been studying to death this problem ever since then to avoid that problem and be successful when we finally do require a retrofit. So you'll see that in 1994, we commissioned um, an, an inventory study, another one in 1995, another one in 2007. In 2008, we convened the first of two very important groups of people. The first was a technical advisory committee made up primarily of structural engineers, architects, and folks like that to say, tell us if we were to, to require mandatory retrofit of unreinforced masonry buildings, what's the right standard to use? For those of you who are not structural engineers or building officials, you should be aware of the fact that building code adopted by our communities is nothing more than life safety. It says that on a daily basis, gravity should not make your building collapse. The, the standard that this technical committee recommended to city staff was something called Bolts Plus. 
So if, if, if uh, building code, basic minimum building code is life safety, Volts Plus is a step below that. Volts Plus says you should make sure that the parapet doesn't fall easily, you should bolt the walls and the floors together, you should do some out of plane surface management work on, on your first floor, but it almost guarantees that your building probably is not going to be useful after the earthquake either. I'm so inspired yet again by California, and with, I know Lucy's a champion of this, of talking about a recovery level type of, of code that makes your building functional after the earthquake. Nonetheless, this is our first step. This is our baby step. This is the step that Californians took 30 years ago. And we tried to learn everything we possibly could from them. We learned that communities, uh, one thing that, that benefited California was the state legislature acted. And they said, all of you at the local level, you will do something to deal with your seismic um, uh, risk. You will mitigate it in whatever way is appropriate within your communities. So we did some, some pretty in-depth study about the various communities and what they did do. Um, those communities, like, like the Los Angeles area, who quickly adopted a, seismic a mandatory seismic retrofit ordinance, but didn't provide much, if any, financial incentive and said, you've got to do this quick, had much higher demolition and abandonment rates than did other communities like Berkeley who phased in the work, provided some incentives, et cetera. So throughout the course of all of these studies, we're trying to do our best to learn about what will work and what won't work. But we, we did come up with Bolts Plus seems to make the most sense for this first step that we're taking. A couple years after that, we convened an unreinforced masonry policy committee. And so if that's the standard that we're going to recommend to city staff and to the mayor and to the city council, what's the rest of the program? What should it look like? That unreinforced masonry policy committee was made up by, by really important stakeholders. We had people at the table who represented um, um, housing, affordable housing, historic preservation, structural engineers and architects, elected officials, people who had been through um, the, the Christchurch earthquake, as, as well as, as our local earthquakes. And most importantly, we had our scientists there with us. So my thanks again to the USGS, to the University of Washington Seismology Labs, and others who kept saying you can't minimize this problem. It's real, and we need to deal with it. The URM Policy Committee, again, took the step most people do when confronted with what looks like an unsolvable challenge. They commissioned another inventory which we dutifully um, um, carried out for them. So we've got, I swear, in Seattle, the best inventory you're ever going to find of these buildings that we have not yet done anything about. Nonetheless, we know an awful lot about them. I'm also going to talk about something that we had done last year. The, the Unreinforced Masonry Policy Committee presented their, um, their findings um, to city staff in late 2017, um, we combined with the extra inventory work they had been working on and then realized the place that we got stuck was financing. And, and as much as I know about a wide variety of hazards that Lisa said, I am not an economist. I am not a budget expert. I am not the person who has the kind of expertise to say, how should we go about financing these? So we wound up contracting the National Development Council, who does specialize in those types of things. The good news is we're still making progress. Glacial as it sometimes feels, we're, we're anticipating being able to release a report that starts to marry together some of those financial proposals. But the extension of this timeline is to, is, is to again, show that sense of urgency. An 86% chance of a, of, a, of a major deep source earthquake within the next 50 years right here but even if we act this year, we're still seven to 13 years away from when all the buildings will have been required to act on a man mandatory retrofit ordinance. My, my joke, do we have anybody from the Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections here by any chance? Some of my favorite people to work with. I, I make a joke about the fact, we've been working on this long enough that the name of their department has changed three solid times. And, so, and I'm sure they're not trying to run away from the problem. They, they are our partners in this throughout the entire thing, but, but we, we need to keep going. We need to act. So the original um, lists of inventories that we have have now been updated by the National Development Council, but I want to show you some of the initial numbers that we were working with and how we intend to propose um, an entire program of how to do seismic retrofit. Originally, we thought we had well over um, 1,100 unreinforced masonry buildings in the city of Seattle. That rep represents approximately 25 million square feet. 
at least 700 of those buildings had no visible sign of retrofit, which is not to say that they weren't retrofit, but it wasn't easy to find out by Google Street View or a walk down the alley whether or not they were actually appropriately retrofit. At least 450 of those buildings have an occupancy of one particular room that can accommodate at least 100 people, like this particular room right here like auditoriums, like churches, like schools, and many other, many other of the critical facilities within our community. So we did our best guess math to say that equates to about 33,000 people in the city of Seattle alone, not all Washington State, city of Seattle alone, who are working, dropping their kids off at daycare, shopping, or sleeping in these buildings. Again, National Development Council is just is helping us right now to update those numbers. The good news is we think we're down to 944. Um, but that's not going away because we're convincing people to go do this voluntarily. We're just getting better, more detailed um, information. Still, that's 20, at least 22,000 people in those buildings. 37 of those buildings represent at least um, 1,559 affordable housing units. I realize we're drawing people from around the country and around the world, but for those of you who know the Pacific Northwest and other areas in the country, we're facing an enormous housing affordability challenge. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to, to, to build some urgency, to, and they have to debate uh, and, and compete for the debate and, and uh, financing space. At least 380 of the buildings are in some form of historic registry identification. The magic of that is these buildings would specifically qualify for historic tax credits, which would be one way to help alleviate the cost of retrofit. Uh, this is ironic. I'm just sharing this with you, my 900 new closest friends. Uh, as we were doing the inventory and the studying, our city council and mayor's office had said, any time any department is going to propose a new policy of some sort, such as seismic retrofit, you will take that proposed policy through a race and social justice equity toolkit process. And I admire that. I admire that to no end. And as you can imagine, what we found was that this particular chart shows there is a direct correlation between where communities of color live and where unreinforced masonry buildings are located. And you can see that there absolutely is a correlation between where low-income populations live and where unreinforced masonry buildings are located. The trick from the emergency management side of this, the, the, this equation, however, was to say that's the impact of the policy. It has economic disparity dispar uh, um, impact on those communities. But now let's apply that race and social justice equity analysis to the earthquake. And let's talk to Ann Brower about how equitable it feels to be on a bus when the bricks rain down. This is not an easy solution. If this were easy and cheap, would have done it, I don't know, the second year after California did it. So here's where we are today. Um, we have the elements of what we're intending to propose from a technical standpoint and from a policy standpoint married together with the work that the National Development Council has recently uh, put together for us. We are, at this point, still saying that Bolts Plus is the minimum standard that we would be looking at because our goal is life safety. We want to make it affordable enough that people will at least protect life, if not necessarily protect the buildings. That means the parapets need to be braced, the floors and the roofs need to be structurally connected to the walls, and any out-of-plane wall surface on the main floor needs to be addressed. With any luck, on the right-hand side of the slide, that means that as, as the earthquake jiggles things, at least the, the walls and the, um, the floors won't separate from one another. The other thing that we did, again, looking at what the lessons from the state of California, we realized, why don't we separate the, this, this inventory of a thousand or so buildings into different categories of risk? Um, and so we did. And, and we said, um, any buildings that, are, that house school kids, public or private, any buildings that represent emergency services, such as fire stations or hospitals, are the most critical risk buildings. And there's 77 of them in Seattle. 76 of them are schools. 
The good news is the Seattle Public School System has for some time in their capital program been chipping away at this problem, but not quite with the same urgency that we would like to and therefore be motivated by um, a policy that requires this. But all of those buildings within the critical risk category would be given seven years to complete retrofit of their buildings. For one year, they can do an, a professional assessment on their own. Did we miss the fact that they had already retrofit and they can be taken off the inventory? Is there something new that we need to know about the building? They get a year for that. They get a year to apply for their permit. We get a year to issue a permit, and then they've got four additional years to actually do the work. So 77 buildings, critical risk would be given seven years to accomplish this work from the date of the passage of an ordinance. Then we had a category of higher risk buildings. These are unreinforced masonry structures three stories or greater that are also affiliated with poor soil conditions. Seattle's a beautiful place. I grew up here, the rolling hills, the mountain views, et cetera. But it also means those views are provided to us on those hills and mountains because we have um, liquefaction susceptibility, we have steep slopes, we have historic and potential slide areas. So we said any of the buildings of the three-story or higher and you're affiliated with one of those poor soil conditions, you would be given 10 years to get your buildings addressed. The, um, the only thing that doesn't change throughout this entire equation is the one year it would take for the city to issue a permit. Everything else we're giving, we're trying to phase this in and give people a little bit more time. The whole rest of the clump is in the medium risk. And for this again, I was so thankful to the scientists and the structural engineers who, who said, don't think that you have such a thing as a low risk unreinforced masonry building. That's an oxymoron. So don't even use it in categorizing your buildings. But the medium risk buildings um, fall into a category that says you could get 13 years to get this completed. The, the cost of this, um, if we were to, to, to again sum up and with the, the great work that's been done by the National Development Council, is about a $1.2 billion problem for the city of Seattle alone. And that's enough usually to chill the blood of most elected officials and slow them down just a little bit. So it's incumbent upon our partnership with scientists and private developers and historic preservationists and affordable housing enthusiasts and everyone else to paint the picture about why this is so critical. So costs. Um, we initially had estimated that the cost of a retrofit was somewhere around an average of $45 a square foot. Again, not my area of specialty, but it is the area of specialty of the National Development Council. So within a matter of weeks, we should be releasing and posting on our website the results of the work that they have pulled together for us. But they helped actually professionally estimate those, those costs. And as you can imagine, different types of buildings, different types of costs. A, 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 a um, very boring one-story rectangular building, very different and, and less complexity than an L-shaped building, two stories, remodeled seven times, et cetera. Um, there's sales tax, there are contingency fees, there's the soft cost of architectural and engineering um, uh, costs, permit fees, inspections, insurance, et cetera. And we don't want to overlook this because this is one of the most critical things and again, political issues, the cost of relocating tenants. I hate this phrase, but I've, I've been told this, that a lot of our affordable ha housing is represented in what's been referred to as organically occurring affordable housing structures. And I'm pretty sure, good Lucy, I think, I think, I'm pretty sure all that means it's an old building and therefore it's less safe. I don't care if it's organically occurring. What I care about is during the shaking itself, are we gonna have disproportionate impact on low income people and communities of color because we never got around to telling the property owners they must do something to, to address this risk. So the work that we had been, um, the work that we handed off to the National Development Council was this. For the entire, the entire year of 2018 and into this year, our staff have invited to the table and we've had individual meetings with banks, foundations, historic societies, uh, community development, financial organizations, a wide variety of people about what they could bring to the table to address what looks like an insurmountable cost problem. The good news is every single person we talked to, when we talked to more, more than 46 organizations, every single person, not a single one of them said, I have nothing to offer. The problem is they all have something weird and customized 
to offer. So the trick is to duct tape it together in such a way that your program will be successful throughout the entire community. We said, show us what all those different ideas are. And there are a wide variety. There are traditional bank loans. There are FEMA mitigation grants. There are historic tax credits. There's special tax valuation programs. There's social impact investing. And there's one that, that I, I need to give a special shout out on transfer of development rights. The idea here was proposed by some private developers in our community who are helping us to wave the banner about how important this is. If you think about a two-story unreinforced masonry building that in today's building boom, we've still got more construction cranes up in Seattle than anywhere in the nation. If you think about the, the, the airspace above a two-story unreinforced masonry building, that as things are being zoned, rezoned around it, but they don't want to develop up, they can sell that developable space to some other redeveloped or newly developed property someplace else in the community. With the, with the proceeds of that sale, they can seismically mitigate their building. So this is one of those ideas that it was private developers helping us to say this could be a privately funded solution to the problem, or at least a partially uh, privately funded solution. So all these people that we've talked to, all these different sources of potential funding, have to get connected in some specialized way to whether or not the property owner is commercial or residential, they're a school, they're a government facility, they have nonprofits operating in them, et cetera. And again, not our, our uh, area of expertise. Other, th th excuse me, other things that are happening, and I'm tying this to the different ways that we can, we can find retrofits, is for two um, legislative sessions in a row, I've appeared before the Washington State Legislature to paint this picture and say how dire the problem is going to be and point out we could be immensely helped if the state would put some type of financial system into place, whether it's the use of real, real estate excise taxes or some type of tax exemption for some of these buildings, et cetera. It would be enormously helpful. Unfortunately, Seattle is not Seattle is not one of the most influential people at the Washington State Legislature, and I can understand why with all the different things that we're facing, including being sued to death and taken to court by our own Supreme Court about making sure we adequately address basic uh, public education in our state. Nonetheless, I did learn at the end of that all those blank faces of legislators were because they didn't understand this is their problem too. So we were successful in the last legislature at getting enough funding in place to require the Department of Commerce to commission their own study. We've already had nine, I don't need a new one, but we do need a statewide inventory of what this problem is. They were given just enough money and less than an adequate amount of time that the firm that they chose drew primarily from existing inventory lists of unreinforced masonry problems. Again, Seattle's got a great one. I can give you the addresses. I can give you a picture for every single one of them. But my surrounding cities, my surrounding counties, and throughout the state, they didn't have necessarily the same data. So now we're functioning with imperfect data, but a really cool map on the Washington State website that shows at least 4,500 unreinforced masonry buildings. It's this kind of work that needs to lay the groundwork, though, to realize we need, we need, we need the state uh, mixed into this solution with us. So again, I've talked about the various types of funding solutions that we're investigating, we're researching. The ultimate program that we pull together will very likely take a mix of all of these together. Um, and again, this is not the only thing that we're doing. Um, some of you may be aware of the fact that one of the lower cost ways of addressing and at least providing risk information and education to the community is to put a scarlet A plaque require a plaque be put on that the front door of unreinforced masonry buildings that says, enter at your own risk. This is unreinforced masonry. It was not built to building code. You'd be surprised at how uninfluential it is to say this is not built to building code. When we've done surveys with people, but would, would you shop there? Would you eat there? Of course I would shop there. Of course I eat there. I, I take my kids to daycare there. So we, we investigated the idea of doing this type of measure as well as many others. I, by the way, am in a dead heat um, competition with my counterparts in the city of Portland. We're also trying to compete with one another and shame our, our elected officials into doing something faster, trying to be the first city outside of California to address this. Instead of a plaque, though, we didn't stop. We are showing people what we are providing hazard awareness. 
Um, there's a map on our city webpage, seattle.gov slash emergency. And we already had tabs on that hazard map that showed you where is their liquefaction potential? Where are the floodplains? Where are different types of hazard impacts? Now we have a special tab that specifically says, are you interested where those 1,100 URMs are? You can click on this map and find out for yourself. Again, raising the awareness because we need to build a constituency of people who will start demanding this kind of safety legislation. Um, Debbie Weiser's in the, in the room someplace, I'm absolutely positive. Uh, and she represents an entity, a new enterprise called uh, One Concern. And we are in partnership with One Concern again to show exactly, it's a big room. It to, so exactly what's the real story of earthquake risk? And so as much as we have, have enjoyed our partnerships um, in, the, in the creation of shake maps, it didn't make it personal enough. And so simply showing a heat map of where damage could occur is a little different than the partnership we have with One Concern. If you haven't met Debbie, meet her while you're here. One Concern actually gives us block level data that says this many of this ethnic community live here. This many of a second language live here. This many school kids are in this particular block, et cetera, et cetera. Again, trying to highlight and make a real story out of what the risk is. Other things that we have done is we've created brochures in multiple languages, especially in the international district, to tell, we, we did three versions of the same brochure, one for business owners, one for property owners, and one for tenants to help, un help them understand what the problem is. In the brochure, we're trying to dispel earthquake myths. And one of the most classic ones is, hey, it's an old building. It made it through the 49 earthquake. It made it through the 65 earthquake. Hardly felt a thing in the 2001 earthquake, not realizing that cumulatively your building is being degraded over time. And you probably stand a far less chance of surviving the next earthquake. The other thing that we did, and I thought this was classic, Nancy Devine is one of our structural engineers working with us in construction inspections. And we realized it's not, you don't, re you don't really have to be a structural engineer in order to figure out if you've got unreinforced masonry buildings in your community. She produced a two minute uh, YouTube video. So all of us, structural engineers, media people, the architects, teachers, air traffic controllers can figure out for themselves, is this an unreinforced masonry building? Should I, should I be concerned? Um, we are teaching our community as best we can to try and create that constituency that does demand action. But what we're left with, and this is where I'll close, is that we're working hard to design the best policy, possible policy without repeating our history from 1974, where we create a mandate and then we repeal it within a number of years. So our perfect policy, to some extent, has to address a number of things. It has to mandate retrofit. Voluntary action has not been adequate enough. It has to avoid high rates of demolition and abandonment because we're already pricing people out of our community that we don't want to price out of our community. It has to address the disproportionate impact you already saw. It must do something to address a $1.2 billion price tag. It has to enjoy some level of both public and private sector support. And the last one is my personal favorite. We've got to beat the next earthquake. And that's getting less probable every single year. I hope again I was the most depressing part of your entire day. We have a few minutes if anyone would like to ask questions, but I'll actually pay cash if you've got ideas that we haven't thought about yet that we should be introducing into our program. Any questions? We've got nine minutes and a couple of, um, couple of oh, here we go. Microphones are set up toward the middle here. Okay. Yeah, thanks for an inspiring talk. So one angle that, that I, I'm not sure I heard, uh, I can illustrate with the 2003 San Simeon earthquake. So that was, that was a, a pretty big earthquake, occurred in coastal California, uh, caused the collapse of a building that was identified before the earthquake, unreinforced masonry, as a hazard. The owner was within the law in not retrofitting it at the time, yet they were sued successfully by those uh, fam the families of the victims, mm -hmm. and it held up to at least one uh, appeal. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, with 4,000 identified dangerous buildings, 
if the owners of those buildings might be motivated to retrofit knowing that they are exposed to that liability. Two women lost their lives in that, if I recall correctly. And yes, we did use that case study and the fact that it has been upheld at least through one appeal when we talk with our staff and when we talk with the mayor's office about this. And it's got to be part of the education throughout the community. It's, I, I, was, um, I was perplexed when we talked with one particular condominium association and they said, but what if we choose to live with the risk? And that's, that's a hard question to answer. Um, but part of our answer was, it's more risk than you think. And secondly, it's not only your risk. Again, harken back to Ann Brower on the bus. But that's a good point, and that that is a step forward in realizing um, this, this is known risk, and we know what it is we can do about it, so, so we need to address it. Thank you. The angle might uh, resonate with liability angle will resonate with some folks. I guess it, dollars incentives resonate with a lot more too. Yes, ma'am. Right, I have no good ideas besides asking the richest person in the world who lives right near here. But um, <laughs> my question is more like related to the, uh, mitigation of, on the personal level. Like, what would you recommend somebody does when they're in an unreinforced masonry building and they feel shaking? Until, like yeah, until earthquake early warning is absolutely reliable, we're telling people get under something heavy. And we are saying be aware of the, 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 the facility you're in. If you've only got a, a couple of seconds, trying to run your way through an unreinforced masonry building may easily put you at worse risk. Another thing that we are doing regarding mitigation, though, is um, we have for 20 years taught classes on uh, retrofitting single family homes. You'll notice that those weren't included in the policy. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. I was curious, have you considered um, any policies that might allow the tenants themselves to take action on a building if a landowner or building owner simply can't? Um, you get $20. You're the first person to mention something that we haven't thought of yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you on the way out. Thank you very much. If there's no other questions, I will slowly make my way to the door. Um, so if anybody wants to catch me on the way out, please enjoy yourselves. Um, uh, if you would like to check out where the unreinforced masonry structures are before you go to dinner tonight, again, seattle.gov slash emergency. <laughs> Do I have one more question? Um, is there a way to say that if you want to live with the risk, that's fine, but we as a city won't allow you to sell the property to some third party? Can yes. you just say? You know, it's yours, but you can't sell it? Yes, we have looked at a variety of mechanisms that attach risk to sales, as well as we've been talking, talking with the real estate community who don't like us as much about disclosure of this type of risk, but yes, we have. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate spending time with you today. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, thanks, Barb. That was a great and important talk. Now, before you go, two things. Okay, first, as many of you may have heard, there's a new policy that will restrict USGS scientists' attendance at some conferences, including perhaps SSA. And SSA is collecting stories, accounts, the more specific, the better. Uh, we would like to know from your own personal experiences the impact of interacting with government scientists at this meeting, at the SSA meeting. And uh, we would appreciate it if you would tell us your story by completing a survey. Uh, it's on the SSA website. Uh, you can click on the policy tab to find the link. And many people have already completed those. Thank you for those of you who, who did. Second, just a quick reminder of this evening's events. Okay, we have three wonderful networking opportunities. Uh, you won't want to miss Rob Graves, uh, our joiner lecturer. He's speaking on simulating realistic earthquake ground motions. That's at 5.30. And after that, there's a reception. Great way to reconnect uh, and also to meet new colleagues. Um, and after that, Gail Atkinson will be speaking at our Women in Seismology reception, which is an exciting new channel of communication that SSA is offering its members. And finally, if you're still hanging in there, um, there is a special interest group on Canadian Cordillera Array from 8 to 9.30 p.m. in Cascade Ballroom 2. So I hope to see you at one of these events tonight. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. 
and this meeting is now adjourned.